Bonjour and welcome on the Gospel Spice podcast, where you are invited to taste and see that the Lord is good. Gospel Spice is your Christ-centered podcast infused with in-depth biblical flavors and sprinkled with a dash of French culture to spice up your relationship with God. Here is your host, Stephanie Roussel, with a guest today. Welcome on this episode of Gospel Spice, which is a very unusual episode because we are in February, which means Valentine's Day season. And I just so happen to have some amazing friends and even someone on my team, my beloved Hannah, who are single women. And we're going to talk about what it's like to be single because that's a topic that's relevant 365 days out of the year, but it happens to be very relevant in February around Valentine's Day. So I'm talking with three girlfriends, Hannah, who is in her mid 20s, Julie, who's in her mid 30s, and then Jan, who is in her early 40s. And they have three different stories and they're going to tell us about what it's like to be single, maybe some advice for single people, maybe some advice for us married people who uh, want to interact with singles and don't necessarily know how to do that or people like me who put their foot in their mouth. So they have lots of advice to give me. So that's what we're doing today. And I'm with Hannah right now. Hey, Hannah, how are you doing today? Hi, I'm good. You and I have actually talked about this for probably a couple of months doing something like this, catering to single people. But again, like really most most of our audience are married, but it's really like, how do you come alongside? How do you love? How do you make them a part of your life? People who are currently single and what it's like to be single, because I also have a daughter who is almost 20 and she's asking questions. So I have her in the back of my mind and some of our other team members who actually have questions uh, so that we can can I get inside your head. Does that sound like a plan? That sounds great. Uh, disclaimer, I do not have all the answers. Uh, whatsoever. Oh, wait, wait. Oh, no, we can't do this then. <laughs> but I love that, you know, because it takes all of us, right? And, and to say I don't have all the answers is actually the wisest thing you could probably say. So, yeah. Hannah, tell us about you. Tell us about your heart as a beautiful single woman in her mid-20s in 2024 on Valentine's Day. I have the absolute privilege of working for Stephanie on the Gospel Spice team. <laughs> don't make that face. I'm hiding. I'm, uh, if, if you're only listening, not watching, I'm like, you know, uh, because... <laughs> And she's I don't know why good. she's doing that because this has been the best job ever. I've been just so happy and lucky to be on this. You see why I love Hannah already? <laughs> so <laughs> easy. <laughs> such an answer to prayer. So I'm very happy to be a part of this team. I'm a marketing project manager. So I run various marketing projects and run our monthly newsletter, which shameless plug, you should go sign up. It is super fun. You get some little freebies every month. Well, tell us about the one we're getting this month. Yeah. Speaking so of, we have something, something beautiful you've created. Thanks. Something really special this month that myself and another team member, Roz, have been working on. It is called the Beloved Study. It is a five day email Bible study. Well, more like a little devotional and it, it, it goes straight to your email every single day. So it's super easy. It goes through five different passages. It doesn't follow a sequence necessarily. They're not connected to each other. So they can be read as standalones. Every day you will get in your inbox, a little devotional. You'll get phone wallpapers. You'll get little scripture cards. There's a Spotify playlist that you can follow along with and a couple other things. Oh, Valentine's, little Valentine's cards to give to your friends. And also with those cards, I want to add, they don't have to be Valentine's. Like they are, they have our beloved, you know, designs, but they're not specific to Valentine's. Roz has kids and she pointed out that she wants to put them in her kids' lunch boxes. And I thought that was super sweet. So if you want to take them on your mirror as a reminder um, on your dashboard in your car. Yeah. If you go to gospelspice.com slash free and sign up, there's a couple different options. So yeah, you should join us. Thank you yeah. for creating that. Yeah. Uh, all right. Tell us about you. Tell us about your life right now. Sure. So I am 25. I am single, as mentioned before. I have been single most of my life. I was in a relationship in high school for a little bit, but other than that, I um, have not been in any anything serious. And I have a lot of married friends now and friends having babies, so it's been super fun. But yeah, so I, I went to Liberty University. So obviously there, you hear the whole 
ring by spring and um, you're surrounded by this like seemingly pressure, honestly, of date, get married, be quick, you know, all the things. So just being in these Christian communities, you just see it so much. So I live in Roanoke, Virginia. I have wonderful community full of people who are married and single and parents. And I lead Capernaum, which is Young Life for Kids with Disabilities. So I have really rich community of people just in tons of different life, life stages. So in a really good spot. What advice would you give to you when you were maybe at Liberty and all of this was happening or to any, you know, again, my daughter who's turning 20 or anyone who is wondering how to navigate this path of singleness or anyone who's married uh, and maybe has someone in their life who's single? How do you come alongside them? What is advice for single people in their maybe early 20s and then advice for those of us who have them in our lives? So I think what I would tell my college self is, and even, even now, is to remind myself I am young. And just because I see so many people around me getting serious with somebody or getting married, that doesn't mean that it is for me right now. And that doesn't mean that I don't have time or it just means it's not God's best for me right now. And so I think that's mainly what I would say is to to not give in to this pressure. I think I have been surrounded by a lot of it, whether it's intentional or not. And I think most of the time it is not intentional. But I think a lot of times it can feel like these Christian communities are sometimes maybe it seems like they're implying that we are not whole or complete unless we are running the race with somebody else, right? And so um, I would just encourage my college self, my younger self to know that that is just not true. I can run the race right now. Like I, I don't have to wait. Oh, I love that because you're giving yourself and others permission to run their race and not wait. Mm -hmm. That applies to so many areas of life. Like I receive that for some of my own areas in my life where I feel like I need to wait for a particular outcome before I can enter the race. But that's just so not true. That's distracting from God's purpose. He has a purpose for you, whatever your married status is yeah it sounds so obvious and yet our culture and even our christian subculture doesn't allow for that so that's um that's good yeah. i want us to chew on that run your race and it doesn't mean you're lesser than when you're when you're single you still have worth and value and honestly that's a lot of what we talk about in the beloved study um the beloved study is not for singles it is for anybody and it's it's been really cool for me writing it because it's been such a sweet reminder of in good times and bad, like we are created with value and, and, and the Bible tells us we are of great value and bought with a price. And just a reminder that you are not lesser than because you are single. Okay. So I have uh, two questions. So we did ask, we have three girls on our team, Grace, Michaela, and Sarah. They're all 19. They're college students. And Sarah is my daughter and two of her girlfriends who are on staff with us. And they're delightful. We love them to pieces. We did ask them, you know, what questions would you ask Hannah and Julie and Jen? And so here's one question that one of them asks. She asks, how do you find contentment in waiting on God's plan? So I'm asking it as she did. What's your answer to that? I don't think we're waiting on God's plan. First of all, I think God's plan is right now. I think God's plan is is our history. God's plan is our future it is right now. Remembering that is really important. Yeah, again, we don't have to wait to to start. We can be in the right now. And also, yeah, it is a season of waiting. Maybe if, if it is a desire of yours to be married, um, then I think focusing on this is this just isn't God's best for me right now. And that is okay. Just because it's God's best for somebody else right now doesn't mean that it's God's best for me. And I I can be patient and I can trust that he is still El Roi. He is the God who sees me. He is still with me. And I, even though I feel this like earthly loneliness, I am not alone. And I think that's just really important to remember. How, how do you cultivate that contentment amidst the season? It's a great question and I'm still working on it. Thank you for saying yeah. that because, you know, people <laughs> feel like they have to have it all figured out, but honestly, none of us has it figured yeah. out, right? right? You know, Paul says, I have learned to be content. And then he describes really good and really bad circumstances. <laughs> yeah. But like, with all due respect, the dude is old by the time he <laughs> says that. <laughs> Okay, we're still figuring it out. And I love Paul. I mean, I can say this because people know me. They know that I have the highest respect for him. But like, um, come on, he's an old man by this point. 
<laughs> so, I mean, this is Philippians. It's one of his latest letters. Come on, right? So, and he says, like, I finally figured it out. It's like, okay, that gives us permission. And what does it look like for you contentment right now? Right now, if you want the honest truth, I am in a season of not being content with it. It is hard. And I think you know, with Valentine's coming up, it's just a time of year that it's so in your face. And, but then you come around and people call it cuffing season and, you know, all these different things that we have these little sayings for, and it's just like, come on. But I think remembering that I can, I can hold two things in one hand. Um, I can hold the tension of, I am so happy for all of my friends who are getting engaged, getting married, having the babies. And I I can love on them and celebrate them and be so like, like walk in that season with them. But in the same breath, I can be sad for myself. I can feel the grief of the disappointment of it not being right now for me. And I think that's true for most areas of life. You know, when we feel let down or hurt by our current circumstance. Like we can be happy for other people who are experiencing what we want and we can still be hurting ourselves and that is okay. Yeah. Someone gave me recently a very kind compliment and she said that uh, what she appreciated in me is that I was cultivating the private sphere. Mm. And that's what you're describing. Basically, you're, it's about cultivating your private relationship with God, cultivating your inner heart, even if outwardly, it doesn't look like you wish it did. Yes. And I think God honors that he really focuses on how we cultivate the inner heart, now, how we are striving for contentment, how we're fighting for it, how we want, we desire contentment. We find him in that and regardless of our external circumstances. And so uh, I'm saying the same to you. I see you cultivating your inner heart, your relationship with him. And he honors that. He values that more than any external relationships. So indeed, God is El Roy. He does see you and he's he's pretty stinking proud of you. I would say. Um, thank you. you know? Thanks, Steph. All right. Before we move on to the next piece, uh, any books or resources? That was another question that someone had. Books or resources you'd recommend? Yeah, there are so many. And and you need to be careful when you look for them. I think there are some things out there that are very like me-centered and focused on the self. But it's Single Dating Engaged Married. That one's great. Annie F. Downs, her she has a ton of great resources and she just launched a singles purpose league, it's called. And so things like that, where you can find community with other people who are in similar stages of life as you. And I also think your best resource, this is kind of a curveball answer, but one of your best resources is, is your people, your community. Don't be afraid to admit when you're hurting. Don't be afraid to admit your desires and, and your unmet desires. I think that's one thing I've been learning a lot is I'm so quick to put on a brave face, right? And being able to be vulnerable is super important. Of Yeah, this is something I want and this is something that I don't have right now and it is hard. And so lean into your community. I think that is that is one of our greatest resources. Obviously, that's not a book or a podcast or a, you know anything, but, but your people are the ones that are walking through it with you. Yeah, it's a real resource. Absolutely. Actually, that's an amazing segue because what we're doing next is that we're going to listen, watch Julie and then Jen. I had a short conversation with each of them asking them specific questions and then you and I are going to get together again after we've listened to both of them because I want your take on what they had to say. I'm excited. Julie Molina, welcome on Gospel Spice. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. Tell us about you, who you are, what you do a little bit and what singleness has meant to you over the years. My name is Julie. I actually am the uh, regional director for International national marketing at The Chosen, which is a TV show. If you haven't seen it, yeah. If you haven't seen it, check it out. Uh, shameless plug. <laughs> well, if they haven't seen it, they haven't they haven't been listening to Gospel Spice because we've been talking about it for years. So <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, thank you for that. Um, and so I work mainly on our Spanish and Portuguese speaking audiences throughout Latin America and Spain and Portugal and so forth. A little bit about who I am as a person. Well, I I mean I would say a daughter of of Christ, trying to figure out what that means on a day to day basis. I don't think I could tell you that I have it figured out, but I know that I am, you know, every day drawing close to him to to try and, and walk in that identity as as his daughter and also trying to find my specific purpose. And I think every day, you know, that can that can change. And every day he speaks to us that way. So basically, I just am trying to be closer to him, not, you know, not anything else. Um, and then in terms of other parts of my life, well, I actually came to Christ 
older. And like, I actually came to Christ uh, when I was 26 years old. I'm 36 now. I came to know Christ when I was 26. And so I think that has really, really changed how my single life has been viewed by me. Because when I was back in my 20s, obviously not walking in Christ, not knowing the gospels and not knowing my identity in him was a very different picture of singleness than what I have experienced and learned in the last 10 years. So I think that, you know, to answer your question of how has it kind of shaped me more than anything, I think it just reminds me of my need for Jesus more more than anything else. And that's not just Christianese. It's just how I feel. <laughs> that's interesting. How, how has becoming a Christian changed your, maybe your perspective on being single? Oh, it's changed everything about my perspective. Um, I know that back in my 20s, I was quite wild, if you will. <laughs> and the, you know, the perspective of it was very loosey-goosey and wanting to, whether I wanted to be single or wanted to be in a relationship. It was always for the wrong reasons. It was always because, you know, if I wanted to be in a relationship, I was, you know, trying to fill a hole or a gap or just trying to have fun. There, there were, I'm ashamed to admit it, but there was times where I didn't even have feelings for somebody. I was just trying to fill some time. Whereas, you know, obviously the, the, the reason, the purpose, the why has absolutely changed completely. Now that I know Christ, that I understand that, you know, there's not necessarily a void in my life for a person. I do want to talk about this a little bit further where, you know, as singles, there, there is a void in our life but it's different than what you experience when you're not in Christ. When you're not in Christ, you think that one person's going to complete you or, you know, it's going to numb some of the feelings that you're having and that and that it's okay. You know, you use other people to fill you up and you think that's okay. Whereas, you know, now walking in Christ, the, the purpose behind everything is different. The way I feel about being single as well as the purpose behind my desire for a relationship. It's no longer to fill me. It's not to fill my time. It's not to entertain me. It's not to please me. It's to bring glory to God. So I think that changes everything. That makes me want to ask you, how do you talk to God about your singleness? What do you tell him and what do you hear from him? Honestly, I don't talk to him too much about it. I believe like I, I know that he knows my heart and he knows, you know, my desires. The thing I talk to him most about it is to not allow me, remember how I was talking about the purpose, to not allow me to focus on finding a person, but rather to help me maintain my focus on him so that, you know, when the right person does come, it's for him and not for me. And so I think that that's one of the things that I do do pray. I said, you know, God, it, I want this, you know, I have this desire in my heart. You already know this desire is in my heart. You placed it there. I don't think it came out of nowhere. Um, I've even struggled to accept that desire, right? Because again, coming from a secular view, it, I was all about, you know, I'm an independent woman. I don't need no man. I am fine. You know, I can play the game better than they will. And I blah, 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 all the lies that we tell ourselves to make ourselves okay with our current situation of singleness. Having to walk in Christ and shed that mentality and actually even come to even admit that it is a desire of my heart to meet a godly man and to form a family with him. That was step number one, just admitting that I wanted it. So now when I talk to him, I'm like, okay, God, I admit it. You know, it's a desire. You know, it's there. I can admit it. Now let's, let's work so that my life is not focused around that desire and so that I don't make decisions that I shouldn't make around that desire. You know, I, um, for example, I recently kind of recently moved somewhere and you have no idea how many people like change cities and states and everything. You have no idea how many people asked me, you know, when I was finding a church to go to, you know, well, you should, you, you should go to a bigger church or you should go to a church that is specific to singles or a church that, you know, where you can meet the, somebody. And I kept thinking, I'm like, that's not how I want to make the decision of what church I go to. I want to go where God wants to place me, not where there's going to be singles, because I'm saying it's, it's not in the numbers. It's not a numbers game. If God's going to bring the person for me, he's going to do it, whether it's at a five person church or a 5,000 person church. And so that's what I mean by not allowing decisions to be made because of this one desire of my heart. That is so wise. You're basically saying that you are not wrapping your entire identity around the fact that you are single. It's a part of your life, but it's not 
your entire life. It's not the key decision maker. And that's not how you chose church. I think it's absolutely beautiful. So, okay, you're talking about church. I know that sometimes the church isn't necessarily the best place to love on singles in a way that is healthy. Tell people like me who are not single or people who are at church, how do you wish to be treated? How do you wish to be welcomed into the church family? Maybe without making singleness kind of your identity. I don't know. You tell us. Yeah, I love that question. It's such an intentional question. And I, I wish more people were asking it. So thank you for asking that question. At the core being of every single person, right? We want to be loved. We want connection. We want to have community. And so think about, you know, from a perspective of, a single person that doesn't necessarily doesn't have an additional person to do life with. That's something that we hear very often in every church. Come do life with us. Let's do life together, you know? And it's become such a churchy slogan, but when's the last time that you actually did life? Like what does that mean? Doing life, right? Like going grocery shopping or, you know, helping somebody, I don't know, pack. I, I travel a lot and I have friends that literally come to my house just to help me unpack, do laundry and pack again. That is doing life. And so, you know, for, for people like you're asking for people that are married and for people that may not know specifically what to do or say regarding singles, do nothing other than connect with us, invite us, do life with us, actually do life with us. Right. Invite us to the things we want to be part of the family gathering because we don't have a family of our own to go gather with. Right. Um, we want to be part of the conversation and part of the groups like the, the women's group should not be focused on wife and mother things because we are women as well, especially women in my age, you know, are really lacking in community because we can't go to the young adult stuff for sure. But then all the women ministry is mostly geared toward wives and motherhood. And that doesn't apply to us either. So then where do we go? And so I think that, that the key thing is understanding that we want and need maybe a smidge more than other people need connection, community to actually do life with you and to actually be invited and, and not be not it be a thing about you know, because she's single, then we're going to treat her in a specific way. Treat me like you would any other 36 year old woman. Um, you know, if it, if it hap if that happens to be coming over to your house, you know, for, for a family gathering, let's do that. Um, whatever that looks like for your life, invite me into it and also be willing to come into my life. Cause my life looks very different, right? I don't have kids running around the house or I don't have you know, the, my life looks very different from yours, but if every once in a while you can come alongside mine as well, and not just me being an added to yours, but we can do this reciprocal. I think that's community. That's what we're called to do and be for each other. I think. Oh my goodness. This is so inspiring. You're making it so practical and so doable. I absolutely love everything you just said. And anyone listening, watching, please listen to this, whatever your status is, whether you're married or not, single or not, whatever. And, and what I'm hearing you say is don't treat me, don't put me in a category just because you think I've chosen to be single. Actually you have, because you've chosen to not settle for any Anything but the best that God right. has for you, right? So in that sense, you have chosen that, but you haven't chosen what that best, quote unquote, looks for you today. And right now it looks like singleness because you're following God. You're not, you haven't settled for second best, quote unquote, which would be, you know, a relationship that isn't God's will for you. So in that sense, you have chosen singleness, but that doesn't mean that you have chosen every single consequence that comes with it, namely maybe the awkwardness in social situations. And so in the same way, like that tells me, well, I want to come alongside you. I want to love on you. I want to be a part of your life discover your life and you discover mine and be a community together even though we're a few thousand miles apart so that <laughs> might be a little hard to do but maybe someday yeah <laughs> I, your wisdom honestly julie your wisdom is so profound and and i think so helpful for anyone watching and listening you know whether they're single or not so you gave us some really good tips for those of us who have families or are married so that we can invite you into our lives and be invited into yours now what would you say you know i'm thinking of my 19 year old college girl daughter and she She's asking all sorts of questions and, and her girlfriends were asking me, I had kind of asked them before talking with you and what questions do you have? And, and they just want tips and advice. You know, you're talking to my almost my 20 year old daughter. What do you tell her? Yeah, I tell her one, be forgiving of the people in the church culture specifically that are making comments or saying things that are maybe making you feel pressured that 
you have to, yeah. you know, that I've heard the expression, you know, ring before spring, right? Ring yep. by spring. Um, yes. Mm-hmm. No. Yeah, no, that's terrible. And, and so I think there's a lot, like I said, I think there's a lot in our church and in our culture that really pushes young adults into, you know, you, this is a thing that you have to do and you have to do it quickly and you have to, and the faster you do it, the better, because you can start your life. So I think I ha- I would say I have two pieces of fight- advice. The first one is be forgiving of all of that. The church is, you know, the church, we're not perfect. We don't get it all right. Um, but that's, it's just not true. You're not under pressure. You are not incomplete until you find this person. You are not uh, less than anybody else until you find this person. And you do not want to rush that decision, which kind of leads me into the second thing. And maybe even more important thing is that, you need to seek God first. And I think that obviously this is, this can turn a little bit um, church cliche when everybody's like, oh, just run. What's the other one they say? Just run as fast as you can toward God. And then whoever's running right next to you, that's the person. I'm, I'm, I run a lot. I don't see I'm running. So <laughs> don't worry about all the little Christianese things that people tell you. Don't worry about the right or the wrong. Just seek God and find literally God, the, the person that God has for you is going to find you literally in him. And so like when you're in God, that's where you're going to potentially find that person. And I say potentially because there's also the reality that it might not be for you. It might not be for me. You know, God himself has never come down and promised me a husband. So you, we have to be so so in tune with him, with the word of God, with what it is that he wants for our lives first, that, you know, we are okay with it regardless. Don't wait, you know, do not wait to start your life. Do not wait to do the things that God has put in your heart. Because while being a wife and being a mother is respectable and amazing, and it is a blessing in and of itself, it is not the only blessing that God has for your life. Before he created, you know, Stephanie, the wife of your husband, he created Stephanie. And so he literally built you and he knit you in your mother's womb already with a purpose, already with a cost, with a with a passion, with desires, with, with all of these things in your heart that were independent of your, your husband or your children. And so when you give yourself the time to not fall under the pressure, but just really get to know God and understand that what is your identity? What is the specific purpose that God has for your life? Then it's going to become so much easier if it is a desire of your heart and it is the will of God. It's going to become so much easier for you to identify the right guy. And when I say the right guy, I don't subscribe to this like there's only one person for every every person or anything like that. But I mean the right guy as in the guy that like God has alongside for you that is going to be compatible with you and that is going to, the, the both purposes are going to work together. If you don't know your purpose first, if you don't know your desires first, who you are as a person first, you might find yourself in a situation where you're with somebody and you're all about, oh, the Bible says I'm going to be a good helper. So I'm going to help him with his purpose and do all his things and have his children and blah, blah, blah. What about your purpose, girl? Like there, there is something where we help each other, right? We submit to each other. We love each other. And I think that the ideal scenario in order to be able to help each other is that you both understand who you are in Christ so that you can both build each other up. And if you're not in that place of of loving Christ and having that deep understanding of who Christ is, you will settle. You will settle for so many things. And then I have have so many friends. And then you will be saying, wow, I don't think I'm 100% fulfilling what I should be or what God would want me to do because, you know, I am either hindered or saddened or all my prayer time has to go toward praying for my husband to be saved because he's not even saved. Like these are the things that come with maturity and not just maturity in age. They come with maturity in Christ. So that's what I mean when I say grow in him so that he can reveal if this is a true desire of your heart, he can reveal how to manage that and how to still be yourself before this happens. And so you're not making decisions, like I said, making decisions for the wrong purpose, you know? Um, my, my therapist, I love him to death. He always comes back to the, why, why did you do that? Why did you feel that way? Why this, you know, why are you making the decisions that you're making? You shouldn't be choosing a church or a school or, or a a career or anything based on, you know, that desire. So I think all of these things work 
together when we are seeking God, he reveals those things to you. So I know that was a really, really long answer, but they kind of work together. You know, don't feel, don't, don't fall into the pressure and just seek God and trust God to speak to you first about who you are. And then, then that's going to make it very easy to not settle and not entertain because there's, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing that can deviate you quicker from God's purpose than being unequally yoked to the wrong person. And so the devil obviously wants that for us. He wants to deviate. He wants to distract, to waste time, to cause heartache. The best defense for all of that is being, you know, so, so good with God that you're not going to settle and fall into any of those traps. And then, you know, if the moment comes when you are married, it's just, it's going to be amazing to be able to work towards God's purpose with this person. I'm nodding so much. My head hurts. I've just been nodding nonstop the whole time you were talking. Oh my goodness. Yes. And amen. And And we can just stop right here because you said it all perfectly. Oh, absolutely. And again, I'm hearing you say you're challenging us all to make sure our identity is not in our singleness or in our married status or being a wife or a mother. Our identity is in Christ. And those things are almost anecdotal to the purpose of our life. Not really anecdotal, but you know what I'm saying. So in light of that. So that is so helpful. We need to wrap up one final word. Yeah, great. I I was gonna say, I'm like, one thing I would even add to that too, is not only like to find your own identity, but also do not walk in the fear, do not make decisions in the fear of being alone. Sometimes like, I mean, Jesus had to go alone in the desert for 40 days before he like, you know, when he really, really received from the Holy Spirit and he had to get tempted there as well, right? There's many instances in the Bible where we see that people needed to be alone. Do not fear being alone. Go to the movie theaters by yourself. Go to dinner by yourself. Invite yourself. Go to your church family and you see a family that's doing a cookout. Invite yourself to their cookout. You know, like make the best of life without being fearful. Because like I said, right, connection is what we all want, right? And sometimes out of a fear for not having that connection and thinking I'm going to grow old alone or, you know, I'm not going to be lovable or whatever those things, that fear ends up making decisions for you. And so, you know, don't fear being alone. That's where you're actually going to, just really, really have really sweet moments with with the Holy Spirit in that complete, complete aloneness. Yeah. And you're an extrovert. So maybe it is easy for you to, you know, invite yourself out to cookouts. Maybe it's harder for people who are more introverted. But again, what I'm hearing you say is plug into your community, invest in the body of Christ and be invested in because again, that's actually being part of the body of Christ, I would say is a more primary calling than being single or or married, right? Being in his body, that's a non-negotiable. And so that's what you're inviting us to do every stage of our life. So Julie, my goodness, so much wisdom. I knew I loved you before, but I love you even more just now. So thank you so much for everything you're sharing with us. Love you, my sister. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing this time with me. I love you as well. Oh, I loved my conversation with Julie. Now I'm welcoming Jen. Jen Hand, welcome back on the Gospel Spice podcast. Oh, so excited when you said, can you come back? Anytime for you, anytime. Let's dive right in. Tell us a little bit about you and your ministry and maybe in light of being single, tell us all the things. My friends call me Jen, so y'all can call me Jen. And I am uh, just so blessed to be in full-time ministry. My yes to God has taken me around the world to about 54 countries now. And I stand on the holy ground of suffering with people after trauma and natural disasters and offer hope. So I do that. I write, I speak, and I drink lots of coffee along the way, Stephanie. So, and I will say that I do believe that the season of my life, which has been my whole life uh, as a single, which I'm 41, and I've been single my whole life, has allowed me to be open to opportunities to serve the Lord as a single. And so I'm really grateful for the untethering that has given me. Mm -hmm. And so I do believe, because people often say to me, you couldn't do what you do if you were married. I will say, I do not believe that is true. If God brings you the person that is for you and he has a calling on your life, he will complement those things. I think uh, there just hasn't been one to catch up with me yet. <laughs> so. You do go really fast. I, I can yeah. see how not easy it would be to catch up with you. <laughs> yeah. I, I hear you. So so how has your perspective on singleness changed over the years? So I would say there have been seasons where I would have said I was called to be single. I said that more because desire for marriage scared me because 
rejection was what I knew. I've never been asked on a date, Stephanie. <laughs> so it's not even like I made this choice. It's like they're not falling at my feet. <laughs> So I think in some seasons, I would say as a guard of my heart to keep from getting hurt by the fact that boys weren't knocking down the door and I wasn't getting dates or anything, I would have said I'm called to be single. But what I realized along the years is that, yeah, I do actually have a desire to be married and to be to serve someone, to be a wife that serves her husband and loves him. And so I don't want to pretend that I don't have that desire, but what God has for me so far has been being single. So reconciling, I'm going to trust you with that desire. I'm going to open my heart and not have a wall, a brick wall, because there have been times where fear of rejection has kept me like walled off. I don't want to have a brick wall, but I also don't want to miss one minute of the promised land living that God has for me right now, because I am waiting for the next. Like God has I don't know what the next is. So I want to live fully in the now. So that's where I am with singleness. I'm open hands, open heart. I would be happy if the Lord had marriage for me. But I, at this season, am also like, okay, this is where you have me. You're mentioning a desire for marriage and a fear of rejection. How have these two maybe changed over the years as Mm -hmm. well? Because I'm assuming it didn't feel the same way when you were 25 as when you were 30 or 35 and now 41. Yes. I mean, most of my stories that I could think of of rejection were like my high school and college years. And then it just got more and more where the the rejection I felt was that there isn't anyone ever pursuing. Um, And so that was more what I've had to wrestle with. And, And I know we have a world where there's dating apps and I'm not against those for others. It is not appealing to me. I, I want to actually know someone and uh, dive deep into that. It just doesn't appeal to me, Stephanie. But so I think it's different when you're in, when I was, my rejection was actually, I think I'm going to marry or want to marry this person and they don't even know it, you know, Um, and the rejection of my twenties is a little different than wrestling with, okay, the lies that could come from the enemy that you just have to silence with the truth is, oh, what's wrong with you? You don't fit the, the, the mold of the rest of society. You're 41 and you've never been on a date. People can really think what's wrong with you. And that can lead you to think what, what is wrong with me? And so Now the wrestling is more just trusting the truth that God's story is good and he does know the plans for me and it's not a rejection, it's his protection. Does it still feel hard sometimes in the dead of night occasionally? Oh yeah, of course. I think anytime, well, I'm an extrovert, Stephanie. I am like, oh, I would love to like be a wife to someone. Mm -hmm. But I, one, I've lived long enough to see, I think if I had gotten married, it would be different in my twenties because you still have this kind of romanticized view. Well, of course my parents are still like newlyweds, so they make it look easy, (laughs) but it's so sweet. They've been married over 40 years and they make it look easy because they're so in love. But I've lived long enough to know that marriage can't fill a hole. Like you cannot be completed by someone else. I've seen a lot of people try. And then I, as a counselor or a friend, have tried to be there to pick up the pieces where, oh, that person didn't compliment me. So I know that marriage is not the end all of the, you're complete, you're satisfied. It can't be. Only the Lord can do that. And you just have to fight actively. Like I just recently moved to be more involved on the same street as my sister to be part of her family. And I didn't even know until I got here, oh, I think I was lonely and I didn't even know it. And now it's so full being Aunt Nin on the same street as the kids. And, you know, so just finding spaces of, okay, I'm going to find family wherever. It may not be in my own home. That's interesting. So you said, you're, you know, your sister is married and she has kids and you're living now on the same street. So you can be kind of the wonderful aunt, you know, mm-hmm. that you maybe wanted to be for a long time. Do, do you and her have these conversations? And does she tell you that maybe, you know, being single does kind of allow you to do things she wishes she could do, but she cannot do as a married woman with kids right now? You know, I'll be honest. Something I appreciate about my family is they don't view me as single. Uh That's a real, I know a lot of friends that that's a real pressure that their family puts on them. To my family, I'm just Jen that's saying yes to Jesus traveling the world. So we actually don't talk about it a ton. And I didn't mean it in terms of pressure, but that's actually what you're saying is, is actually a very good advice maybe for families of a single woman or man, I guess, to say, yeah, that's not your status. That's not who you really are. That's Mm -hmm. not your identity. Yes. I, 
So appreciate that because we don't view married people necessarily as their identity is only in that, but often the church doesn't mean to admit per se, but they put singles as you're over here in this category. That's your identity. I appreciate that as far as with my family, there is no pressure. There's just like, let's just celebrate where you are. I love it because that means they truly see the beauty of what God is doing in and through you, as opposed to trying to force you to be someone God is not making you to be right now. Mm -hmm. So, um, Advice, advice maybe first for single people who are listening. Let's say, you know, advice for you. If you were talking to the younger version of you when you were, I don't know, let's say 25, any advice you'd give yourself looking back? Oh, I love that question. That's really good. I think the advice I would give is when you are rooted in the truth of God and what he says about you, that's that's my advice. So the 25-year-old version, I knew the truth and I, I'm blessed I've grown up knowing Jesus since I was eight. Um, but letting, acknowledging the areas where I needed the truth to defeat the lies. I wish I had done that sooner. So that comes with acknowledging the lies, the rejection, the what's wrong with me, the I must be blank because I can't get blank. Um, really, instead of pretending they're not there or running from those lies, it, open hands, these are lies. Okay, what's the truth? That's what I would say to my 20 year old self, because I think that they were so embedded, they felt like truth without even realizing it. So taking the time to analyze your your thoughts and your belief system and, and realize that there's got to be some faulty thinking. Yeah, yeah, that's good. What would you give advice to the same version of you five years ago? Would you give the same advice? I think, yeah, I think the five years ago version of me as well. It, I One thing that I have seen great joy in is the more I admit to the Lord, I do have desire. That's what I would continue to say to my five-year past tenure. Um, I spent a lot of years, like I said, just numbing that, pretending that desire wasn't there. And there's a difference in hope and release when you say, okay, I actually would love to get married someday versus not admitting that. So I wish I had released that sooner mm. because it's just when you do that, then you run to God in a different intimate way because hope is different when you actually have to hold on to it. Wow. That's profound what you just said there. That's beautiful. And I think that's true for any desire someone's praying for or has. It can be scary to hold hope. I learned a lot about holding hope while still living, living it up in the present. You know, Jesus does tell us, ask whatever you want in my name and, uh, you know, you will receive it. But at the same time in Gethsemane, he asks for the cup to be taken and it is not taken. So mm -hmm. Jesus, his prayers, his desires, in that case, the desire to have the cup pass was not taken away from him. And like he didn't get the desire mm -hmm. of his heart, even though he is sinless. And I think he didn't get the desire of his heart so that we could get ours when we abide in him, when we join him in Gethsemane and we say, not my will, but yours be done. I have this desire, but... But if it is not your will for me, then I want your desire, your will for me more than my desire, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And that's just, but it's so hard. Oh, it is so hard to do. <laughs> it is. And I think that's what I wish the 20 year old version of me had understood, understood more because it was easier to brick wall the desire than to hold it open and surrender. You know, we, we want to grow in maturity and wisdom, but we don't realize that it takes years and years to do that. Mm -hmm. And so you just have a perspective that you just simply could not have had when you were 20 or 25 years mm -hmm. old. That's right. I'm so grateful for the way God has met me, the 20 year old version of me and the 40 year old version of me. And also living in community because we need one another mm -hmm. for the wisdom, right? Just like you want to speak into the reason why you came to, you know, when I invited you to talk about singleness was because I'm I'm thinking you want to give hope to someone who's listening and who's in your shoes or who's younger or older, and you just want to give hope. And so it's just this community of doing this together. Oh, yes. And I, that's the thing about being single is you can't isolate, you have to dig deep in the community and it is the best gift. Right now, I, like last night, I was with the youth. I just got to pour into some youth. And then later, I will be in my community group, which is married and single and all different stages of life. We just have to do life together. That is the body of Christ. Final question. What's your advice for those of us who are married and who honestly are the first to put maybe our foot in our mouth when we speak to single women? And actually, I need to publicly apologize to you because I did that with you when you were on Gospel Spice and we were talking and you were talking about being single. Briefly, I think we talked about that. And I said that I said the very thing you said is actually not helpful. I said, because you're single, you get to do things that a married person wouldn't get to do. Mm. 
and and you caught me very gracefully and you you did it with such grace but I remember feeling this twinge of like oh I hurt her and I didn't mean to and so mm. I apologize for that and would you help people like me not hurt you unwillingly how do we how do we talk to a beautiful woman who loves the Lord and just happens to be single that's not the identity of who she is it just mm. happens to be her current stage of life how do we encourage her or him oh, I guess it works I for too I love that. And you do not have to apologize one bit. And often I get told that about once a week, you couldn't do what you're doing because you're single. And I think the biggest thing I can say is that we often say things because we want to have an answer for what we may not understand. Like in love, people are like, Jen, I mean, I'm thinking they're thinking you're not, you, you, you know, you love Jesus. You're fun. You, you're positive. Like you've traveled the world. You make a great wife and they have to have a reason for why I'm not. So I think as a married person, it's important to not feel like in that tension, you have to have an answer or a reason, except for that God's story and his glory is being lived out through whatever that phase of life is. Same for anything. Like, I I mean, you you honestly wouldn't, I don't think it would be different if someone's wanting a child and doesn't have a child. Someone wouldn't say to them, well, you couldn't do what you're doing because you have children, mm-hmm. don't have children, you know? Um, so I think just um, not making a person their identity as their singleness, but just celebrating with them and then listening when they're lonely, you know, not having to have an answer, which is true of anything. We want to have answers because we want to help. Um, and sometimes sitting in the tension of there not being a easy answer is hard, right? So that's my, just, I'm so grateful for my married friends though. Like I am so grateful for people that invite me into their lives, their families, their stories. We need you and you need us. Yeah. I don't think Paul anywhere says, you know, give advice to people who need advice or give them answers, (laughs) but he does say weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. So rejoicing with you and grieving with you on on the good days and the bad days. That's really good. So Jen, what are your thoughts about Valentine's Day? It's very soon. Yes. And I actually love Valentine's Day, even though I've never had an official Valentine. I think I love a good theme and the theme of Valentine's Day is love. So my favorite thing is to celebrate that. I love to get together either people that are lonely or maybe a married couple that needs a date, watch their kids. Like it is a time to pour out love. And so I actually really love it. Mm -hmm. I even got my fingernails painted the bright pink Pink. this week for uh, Valentine's. And the lady's like, do you have a Valentine? I'm like, no, but I'm loved. And that's the key. Do you have any plans already set up? Well, it's actually, you know what? This Valentine is uh, Ash Wednesday. So I will be with my church community celebrating the beginning of Lent. What a perfect time to celebrate the beginning of Lent, the beginning of the Easter, the real love story. Yeah. So that's what I'll be doing. Oh, I love it. Any final piece of advice that you would have for us? Anything else you want to tell us? I think whether you're single, married, wherever you are, it's so easy to get caught up in what we don't have. It's so easy. And we just have to fight for the joy of the Lord is our strength. This is what he has given us and being grateful and, and but also being willing to share with the Lord your heart when you don't feel grateful. So I would say that like, Thank him for where you are and then be open with him with your disappointments when you're like, but this isn't where I want to be. And then that goes to every area of life. All of us can relate to that. So mm-hmm. I think it's beautiful the way you're saying it because you're saying, hey, this is like any other area of your life where you have a desire that hasn't been met, but you're just striving to, to be in God's will and you desire his will more than your own desire. But there's that tension because we're human and we all can relate to that. The great equalizer is whatever stage of life you're in. We're not in the final stage, which promised to us that's heaven. And so we have to learn how do we live out his glory in our specific story here on earth. Oh, Jen, thank you so much for being with us. I love your wisdom and your heart. Oh, it was so fun to be with you. We just listened to Julie and Jen and I'm with Hannah again. And I would love your thoughts. But before we go there, can I say, and did anyone else notice who's watching or listening, those three girls Hannah, Julie, and Jen, they are so completely all in for the kingdom. Like they have thriving ministries. They are not, absolutely not in waiting mode. They are completely absorbed by their calling and their kingdom work. And I am just so inspired by them. So uh, Hannah, any major takeaways from Julie maybe, and then from Jen? Yes. Oh my gosh. I took so many notes. Literally so good. I felt super encouraged. A couple of things that I'll I'll go Jen first, then Julie. Jen said, um, it's not a rejection. It's his protection. I love a one-liner. I love something that rhymes that I can remember that's easy. And I 
Loved that. And we can say that for literally so many things, not just uh, like relationships. And so I loved that one liner. So okay, good. say it to us again. Give us give it to us again. What was that one liner? Of rejection. It's his protection. Let's all take and that home today. I will be writing that down and putting it on a sticky note on the mirror. So good. And I also loved when when she said singleness isn't your status or your identity we don't see married people as that oh yeah she's a married person we we put on this hat of this is my identity and it's not it it's just a part of our lives right now but it is not the core of who we are i loved that she compared it to to we don't call married people married people <laughs> as part of their identity um it just it seems so silly to say out loud when we do you know like we don't need to just put singles in a category but we can be healthy members of the church and we can be important and parts of of life groups and serving and and things like that. So that marriage is not the end all be all of completion and satisfaction. Like we find our completion and our satisfaction in Christ because he is the only one that is complete and that can make us complete. That is that is it. Just love that. Um and believe me, us married people, we know that really well, but we're not like, <laughs> yes. this does not make us any more complete. There's just this <laughs> weird idea out there. But like it's a myth for everybody. We all know it's yes. not true. Or we should and know I don't it's know not why true. we do that. Like right? I, I I don't know how that started or how we got there, but from the pit of hell, girl. That's where it yeah, started. Yeah. Make everyone feel insecure and unfulfilled and incomplete. It goes against Christ to say that. So and something that Julie, a couple of things she said that really stuck out to me is that she asks God not to allow her focus to be on finding her person, but to maintain her focus on the Lord. So when when and if her person comes along, it is for God and not for her. And I think so often we hear, you know, like find your contentment in the Lord and and then because of that your person will come. I get I get why we say that, but if our person comes, it is not for us. It is for the Lord and for the kingdom and that is what the unity is about. I just loved how she said that. I I think it puts a really good extra something, you know, on that common like phrase that we hear. And then also her emphasis on actually doing life together. I live with chronic fatigue and some funky little health things. And so I've learned so much of this. Like I have friends that will just come and sit on my bed with me while I attempt to clean my room. Or, you know, they will come and just be in my presence because I can't go do something fun that day because I'm too fatigued. And and they will just come and sit on my couch and be close to me. And, and that is doing life together. I have learned so much more about what that looks like through these health issues that I've dealt with. And so that that was just really cool to me and and I think it's so valuable and and talks about you know what we talked about earlier about lean into your community as your resources lean into your people it's so important I have benefited so much from listening and learning from the three of you. I'm so grateful that you've been so open and vulnerable. So seriously, Hannah, thank you. And Jen and Judy, thank you so much for paving the way for people like me to understand a bit more and, and walk a mile in your shoes in, in a tiny little way. So I'm, I'm so grateful for your vulnerability, your candid honesty, and most importantly, for your fire for mm. Jesus. Oh my goodness, you inspire me so much. So thank you so, so much. Well, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm so glad I got to do this. It's been really fun. And don't forget, go get your beloved resources on the website, yeah. on the newsletter, because you don't want to miss out. It's really, really cool stuff. Whether you're married or single, it does not matter. Your status is in Christ, not in yep. whatever relational status you may have right now. So thank yep. you, Hannah, so much, dear friend. Love you. Thank you. Love you. Hi, Jonah here. Thank you for being part of the Gospel Spice family. If you've enjoyed this episode, you will love receiving our newsletter. It contains value-packed free gifts and rich content each month. It's at gospelspice.com slash sign up. There is always something new and exciting happening around here, and I don't want you to miss out. Sign up at gospelspice.com slash sign up. Did you know Gospel Spice has a YouTube channel? There's exclusive content there too. So join Gospel Spice on YouTube. Also, please give us a star rating and a comment on your podcast listening app. Your reviews actually really do make a difference to help others discover and experience Gospel Spice. As always, we are praying for you. You can confidentially email us your prayer requests and praise items at the email address contact at gospelspice.com. It's our privilege to pray for you.
So, I'll leave you with four things to do. Please pick one and do it at your convenience. One, sign up on our website for our newsletter to receive gifts you're going to love. Two, find us on YouTube and see what content we've put together to help you grow closer to Jesus. Three, rate Gospel Spice on your listening app. It's one of the easiest ways to share the gospel. And finally, four, tell us how we can pray for you. Merci. Merci.